There is always an open mind to speak out for our opinion. Something that we would like to talk about as a threat. Have any suggestions, comments or opinions on Singapore public bus industry? Welcome to Hashtag Debate! In today's episode of Hashtag Debate, we will talk about one of the latest news articles related to the Singapore bus industry. As published by the Straits Times today as this was recorded, the headline titled, Jury Still Out on Bus Contracting Model Here. As this was split into three parts, we will explain bit by bit. Before we go on, this debate is just our thoughts and opinions. We are not bringing a hate speech of politics, but knowing that what is happening and we have every right to share our opinion. Back in 2012, LTA introduced Bus Service Enhancement Program or BSCP. For the past four years, this overhaul in the bus industry has involved the bus service frequency and purchasing new buses under the BSCP scheme. Until 2016, LTA had fully taken over the bus industry named as Bus Contracting Model. Today, most bus deliveries are in the large screen as the public vote held back in early 2016. With Tower Transit that took over Bulim, followed by Go Ahead with Loyang, they are the first foreigner to win a bus package share in Singapore. The government had taken over all public bus assets and infrastructure, paying private bus operators to run such bus services as City Direct. Now in 2021, after 5 years since the introduction of bus contracting model, it still knows whether it is a success with questions over its financial sustainability and the lack of public data. However, for bus packages, some people have commented that it is weak. For example, SMRT buses have been losing so many bus packages when the way they run their buses have been improved all over the years. And why does Go Ahead Lo Yang get his additional 2 years standard first term contract when Tower Transit gets the second term for Bullying for the next 5 years alongside Mandai? We already know the reason why but things like this because might not go well to the public as we speak. The primary assessment is to improve the existing bus service nationwide. The majority of the commuters were satisfied with the changes in its frequencies over the years. From a variable bus frequency into a shorter waiting time, this includes feeder services that serve the community in the neighborhood. As mentioned under BSCP, bus services introduce a new bus timetable with new trips added for the entire day, especially peak hours and an upgrade of fleet capacity. It is to prevent overcrowding and long waiting times during peak hours. Unfortunately, a handful number of commuters are not satisfied with the data. They are not going to react like this. At some point in time, bus services may encounter a very long headway, and this involves a long waiting time. Due to traffic conditions or the bus breaks down in the middle of the trip, bus operators try their best to cover its headway by deploying an emergency bus to prevent long waiting times. Under the bus contracting model, we have to see the predictability of the bus services, or we can say how likely your daily bus service is to turn out at the same time every day. Instead of improper timing, all bus services had been regulated with a fixed timing to reach specific bus stops. And this is where most bus services like 79, 175, 966 and all modified bus services except service 901M has an on-time arrival. Be it every day, weekends or just Sundays and public holiday, the bus service always maintains its headway on time. But this will not apply to bus services that involve a hefty load of demand and feeder services. One such example under bus contracting model is for service 851 and Eastern feeders under SMRT buses back then. Many copies every day regarding their fleet capacity and frequency during peak hours. Now with SBS Transit, more double deckers will be applied on service 851. With service Express 851E, 
the loaded demand of Service F51 had reduced due to its alternative travel to and for Amokyo and City. However, the frequency had improved as the entire bus services nationwide could be the result on the BSCP the most, and not the BCM. Let's not talk about the pay of bus captains, but rather talk about the financial. LTA stopped publishing the number of incentives doled out to bus operators here, and has repeatedly declined to furnish figures. In the first service year, bus operators had earned nearly $20 million in incentive payment. However, the path of least resistance is getting taxpayers to pay more. Now, by reading the article, you might be thinking something deeper in detail. The taxpayers that are involved in purchasing buses. There are over 200 registered buses in storage as of today. And some of the Volvo B90 L CDTE units were retired at the age of 15. That's two years earlier than its usual lifespan age. It's not just for performance on these CO3 buses, but also to utilize the excess MAN A95 Batch 5 that they had bought. Also, a lack of proper planning had been made, especially during this pandemic, where short working bus services like 72B, 138B, and now defined 170A are still running even during the circuit breaker. Speaking of lack of proper planning, this appears a good amendment of bus services today. The Bukit Panjang and Pasir Sagas is a great form of an example where the most beneficial bus services were either amended and redrawn due to the loss of profits in certain bus services that involves the public funds to operate. Back to the headline, the bus contracting model is still in the early years of implementation. LTA will continue to study and evolve the model over time based on feedbacks from the operators and commuters. So, what are your thoughts about this? Are the financial overall in a bus contracting model relates to the loss or the disadvantages as mentioned earlier on? Leave your comment down below. Thanks for watching and see you in other series. Uh, uh, uh.